um, even though I, I obviously knew, knew of her, but I never knew her personally. And so I just felt you know, very compelled to, to make this film. Was it rather a difficult film to make, given that there were so many people around who knew Marie, who loved Marie, who had such a kind of stake in her life? And in, I mean, I know that at the paper, when we knew that this film was being made, we all felt quite protective about the Marie that we all knew and, and loved. Did you feel, I know Rosamond, who I interviewed for the Sunday Times magazine, talked about a huge, um, important, terrible importance to get it right, knowing that there were so many people around in her family who, who you were going to you know, be portraying her too. Yeah, I mean, when I first started, uh, there's quite a large amount of reticence uh, amongst her friends and colleagues. Um, <laughs> uh, that, that's like the understatement of the decade, isn't it? And, uh, and it was actually at, on this stage where I asked Paul to, to moderate a Q&A for, for my Syrian documentary, City of Ghosts, and um, a number of Marie's friends came, and it was actually quite a, a breakthrough moment for me um, to show that I'm not some Hollywood alien, um, <laughs> but that I, you know, sort of come from the same background, and I care about the same things, and, you know, my, my main goal in this new art form was to try to, you know, create as authentic and real a portrait of, of her and experience being war, war correspondent as possible. Um, and tell us a bit about how you went about that, because some of it wasn't scripted, wasn't it? It was quite, um, you did some kind of quite free-form dialogue. Rosamond was telling me that you, she would think about, particularly the, the times when Marie's you know, really not very happy and reliving a lot of this stuff, that she would sit in a room when you would have the camera on her while she was kind of having to think about all this stuff. It wasn't just like a classic shoot. Um, I don't know what a classic shoot is because I've never made a movie before. But, um, <laughs> Rosamond didn't think it was that orthodox. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I tried to bring as much of my documentary ethos into this process as possible. When I was 21 years old, I heard Al Maisel speak, and he said, you know, if you end up with the story you started with, you weren't listening along the way. And that's something that I've held very near and dear to my heart at every step along the way in my documentary career. And I tried to bring that into this process, you know, as well. You know, be open to the story changing, be open to the, the wonderful accidents of life. And so, I, you know, I wanted to create an environment on set where real stuff could happen. Um, you know, and a lot of the extras and things were people who'd actually been what were Syrian refugees and things, weren't they? Because you shot a lot of it in Jordan. Yeah, I just, yeah. Um, so yeah, so like when we see the mass grave, those are real Iraqi women reliving real trauma. Um, when we're in homes in, in Syria um, and she's interviewing the two you know, women in the widow's basement, I spent weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks um, interviewing and finding women um, who actually were from homes, who actually were in the widow's basement. Um, so they were telling their own real stories, shedding real tears. Um, you know, when, when you go to the hospital afterwards, uh, the man who brings in the young boy, his, he was from homes as well. His two-year-old nephew was shot off his shoulders um, by a sniper and bled out in front of him. And so the sort of grief and the trauma and the emotions that he brought on, onto the set were almost uh, unbearable. And at one point, Rosman walked off set and said, you know, I'm not sure I can handle this. I, and I don't know what's happening. The sort of lines between documentary and, and fiction are so blurred. Um, Is this okay what we're doing? Are, are we exploiting this man? And I said to her, look, you know, this is something that I deal with on a daily basis um, in my documentary work that Marie dealt with, and now you're having to deal with, which is, you know, you have this human instinct to want to give someone a hug, or to sort of, you know, give them space, but your job is to is to capture these moments, um, and, you know, and he wouldn't be here if he didn't want his story told. Yeah. Now, Rosa, when I interviewed Rosamond, she said to me, and she's played all sorts of different roles, and of course she played a psychopath in Gone Girl and all those kind of things, but she said nothing had stuck in her head quite like playing Marie and that there was a bit of Marie that would always be with her and I remember her sitting and looking out the window and, to, and tears trickling down her face as she talked about it and talking about meeting these people and kind of how traumatised she'd been by the whole process and Paul you were you were on set a lot weren't you yeah um what was that like for you having been 
they were in reality. I mean, quite fun to be played by Jamie Dornan. It was all right. We had to force feed them pasties for a month to get them into shape. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> no, but, I mean, it's been all right. It's not done me no harm. Another month and it'll be like, no, no I am Jamie Dornan. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, what? what a, <laughs> we've got to get over the old spanky thing. Quick, I'll get it out of the way. <laughs> no, I mean... <laughs> what, what, <laughs> I think it's quite fair to say that Paul's being quite like likes being played by Jamie Dornan. I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> it's done me no harm. But no, anyway. De- <laughs> you deviant. <laughs> you were the one who mentioned the spanking. I know, I know, I did do it. I did spank him on stage once. <laughs> but no, they, what a great... I think we're going into a different conversation. Can we go nice. back to the was set? That, was that a dream? <laughs> She realised that I'll reenact it. No, they, I've got to get serious now. Yeah, no, no, no. Right. it's a serious okay, discussion. Serious in again. Um, it, was, it was a little bit daunting going out onto the set because obviously our colleague, our friend, everyone loved it. And, you know, I did feel a sense of responsibility about going out. So how is this going to be? Everyone had said, you know, it's, it's kind of Hollywood. You know, you'll get on set, you'll spend a day there, then you'll be sent to a hotel 20 miles away. And I think, you know, when I got there and I spoke to people the next day, they said, we were all dreading you coming out because, you know, we're, we're trying to make a film about something so close and dear to you. Um, but it, it really, that lasted a few hours. You know, once they realised I wasn't kind of up my arse about things and was approachable, and once I, re- you know, got the feeling that they were all completely on side about this film and wanted to do the best possible job, then it, it was a really quite a natural process. I mean... And what was the moment where you realised that um, Matthew actually was on side and was going to do a good job? Downstairs on the table that we've just eaten at, we, we did the City of Ghost screen and we did the Q&A and I, I went down, we sat there and you know, a few beers were taken and we, we chatted and Rosman was there and, and Matt said, you know, this is Rosman, she's going to play Marie. And I turned around there's Rosman all like, like a swan, all elegant and... And then I thought of Marie in a trench in Misrata, and I was like, yeah. 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 <laughs> OK. That's going to yeah. work. <laughs> um, but no, and, and, and Jane was there. It, it really, you know, Jane Wellesley was there. And so it was just... I walked out of, the, out of that meeting in that evening, you know, completely at ease with what was, was going to happen. And, and Matt, you know, made the process. You know, we did... You know, I felt involved from the beginning. We looked at the script. There was stuff we worked on there. And then on set... It was just a really nice... I met Jamie at the airport. I got off the plane, and I hadn't seen him on the plane. I just I was like, oh, great, hiya. Gave him my bag, ran off to Duty Free, and come back with 400 Marlborough. <laughs> and he goes, fucking hell, just like the boo. <laughs> and, and, and that was it. You know, we, we, it was so natural with Jamie. And, you know, I think Matt said after he met Jamie that, you know, there were similarities anyway. So... Of course. <laughs> no, not like that. <laughs> of course there are, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was, it was a great process, but, you know, I, th- I think seeing Roz and Jamie, you know, in this incredible, you know, the amount of work that goes into making it look, you know, that media centre in Homs, I walked in there and it was like, whoa, that was incredibly realistic. And then, you know, you put them in, in costume and, you know, I was just sitting there and, you know, it, I believed it. I sat there and it was a strange one because... I Isn't it really weird to see things that you've actually lived through being acted out? Yeah, it was, but it, it wasn't in a way that... I, I didn't find it uncomfortable. It made me reminisce slightly. You know, I'd be sitting there watching and I'd think, oh, wow, you know, I miss... God, I miss her, I miss what we do. Yeah. But it also, you know, triggered these little things like they'd be doing this really serious thing and I'd be laughing <laughs> and, and people would be going... What's he laughing? And it, what it was happening, I was thinking of what had happened just before that scene. And with Marie, it was generally something funny. Yeah, definitely. You know, and so when other people were looking at the scene for what it was, I w- it was triggering off little moments for me of, you know, real happiness. Because like, I would never have thought of that moment if I hadn't sat and watched them do this. But at the end of the day, it was, you know, just a, a real honour to work with Matt and Jamie and, and Roz and see people putting so much in... To, to, to getting it right and telling the story. And, you know, really all commendations to, to everyone who, who put that together. Really, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a really fantastic film. It's very strange to see 
a film I mean for you but also to see someone you knew who was a colleague being played by somebody else I mean it's a really it's a it's a kind of strange process and we were all worried that maybe they wouldn't catch kind of Marie's vitality or the skill she had at eliciting interviews out of people which was amazing and but they did I think Rosamund brilliantly catches both her her accent and the way that she speaks and the hair is brilliant and also th th there's really something of Marie in the way she talks to the people I think I think she I think you did incredibly well on that and well, when I saw her come out uh, the, the physical transformation was was incredible but really what struck me was her movement the way she lit cigarettes the way she poured a drink you know that, that is you know I, c I can understand that a wig and the, that does it but it was her movements when I had a talk they stick, gave me a set of cans and I was watching the monitors and I, you know I got the hairs up on the, yeah. the back of my neck and my hands and she'd stay in character all day and really, what she yeah, never. In case I'd be sitting there having a fag with my headphones, and I'd say, "Where's my fucking coffee?" And I'd go, <laughs> "She's back," and she wasn't even on camera. She's just sitting in a trailer, but I was getting the signal through. Okay, and you could, so she didn't one go day, back to being awesome yeah, the other body double. Yeah, on the set as well, and I was sitting there, and I was like, and "One Marie went that way, and the other one exactly went that way," and I was like, "I'm hallucinating." <laughs> Sorry, when Paul's in the room, it's easy to become quite um, jokey and glib about things. But actually, <laughs> of course, this is an it's an incredibly serious film and really important issues. Um, we reckon there were about seventy one between seventy one and eighty journalists who've been killed doing their um, duty over the last year, and um, it was remarkable. I mean quite lucky for you in terms of the release of the film but also brilliant for Marie and her family that last week the American courts made this really landmark judgment saying that um, President Assad's people had or well, Assad himself had targeted Marie in Homs as you always said bracketing bracketing you got it bracketing which is when, um, do you want to tell us a bit about bracketing? Uh, it's, it's just an, an artillery technique for getting a target. They find, they, what they do is they fired a few rounds, a couple of rockets, whatever they were shooting. And on the day, I had one go about 100 metres to the right, 100 metres to the left, a 30 second gap, and they adjusted the rockets. And the next salvo of two came in 50 metres aside. And at that point, you know, I was just like, I know what's happening now. And I, and I kind of counted down 30 seconds, I knew something. And, and the next ones were directly on target, which is what killed Marie and Remy instantly. Um, and, the, and the judgment it says quite clearly, you know, there's a, there, it's an incredibly worded judgment. There's no ambiguity. You know, the Syrian regime tracked, targeted and killed Marie. Yeah. And I think, you know, f not just for their family, you know, a lot of this was about, this case was about, we had the ability and the resources to bring the case. But, you know, it is to highlight the fact that this government were shelling you know, civilians, and and it's a, it's a judgment that can be used for you know for possibly further criminal prosecutions, but also a piece of paper we can wave at our politicians as as what's happening now is this creeping back into the fold of the regime again, and you know some we better deal with them, and I think the Syrian people deserve a bit better than that. So any of our lot trying to get close to them, they, I'm going to be there kind of waving this piece of paper going, fucking murderers. Well, I think anyone anyone it. who's seen this film, or I also um, urge you to watch Paul's brilliant documentary, um, Under the Wire, which kind of picks up where your film ends in a way, which is some real footage of them kind of going into homes and kind of and what happened next. But I think looking at that, your incredible last shot where you where you see where they were in homes and it comes out and out and out and you realise it's not just you know one building it's not just marie and paul being targeted it's all those you know thousands of people who've been killed by assad and his regime and i think all, kind of all of us owe it to marie's memory not to not to let that regime off the hook yeah. i mean that's certainly at the sunday times and the times we feel really strongly we're going to we'll keep campaigning on that and i think that this american judgment really brings into focus that you can't let tyrants get away with killing people who are trying to tell the truth and i think in a world of fake news that 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 lesson's incredibly important um and also that increasingly you know this is a women in journalism kind of event and here we here we are at the front line club that increasingly journalists are being specifically targeted for doing their job which never 
used to be the case. I mean, we were talking a while ago, there was a lovely lunch given um, in Marie's honour for the film, and we were talking there about how this is a really, this is a really kind of coming issue. So we've seen the murder of um, Khashoggi in um, Turkey, um, journalists killed in Euro on European soil. When I first started out being a journalist, that really didn't happen that much. Journalists were like medics. They they weren't actually targeted themselves, and this is a this is a kind of growing problem all over the world. So I I, I think it's brilliant that this film is coming out now. Kind of journalism needs it. I mean, you said your mum was a a journalist. Is she proud? But proud of me? Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> oh. um, I'm sure you've all got some questions for our panel. Oh yeah, Austin's here with a microphone. Is it what? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask a straight, uh, not a strange question, but a bit of an interesting one. Um, so you, you see the ending where obviously it happens. How was that for you? Because obviously that painful. Jamie Dor Jamie, <laughs> Jamie, Jamie oh, not in that. the film. No. Yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> it's good that you can joke about it. I like that. But it's 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 obviously Jamie Dornan playing you. Yeah. And what we what when you watch the film you forget that that's actually happened to you so watching that back either now or whenever you watched it for the first time how did you feel were you because it's reliving a really tragic really horrendous yeah. event how did that make you feel as a well uh, jamie good enough I'd, I'd been taking a lot of stills on the set during the, the production and when it came to that scene yeah i think i shot the i was shooting stills that we got the explosions but once they had ros on the ground and they were kind of put the blood and the makeup on. Jamie just came up to me and walked me away and said, you really don't have to be there for this bit. You know, he said, he just, in that, it says a lot about the way it was, it was handled. You know, people were really respectful on set and that Jamie just took me and put me in a room and put me on a chair. And so I didn't see that till we, we did the screen and... Um, you actually fell, you fell asleep at the moment. Yeah, I fell asleep, yeah. Yeah, I was knackered. <laughs> took me away and he did find me kind of like <laughs> with my headphones out. and I'm glad I didn't see it you know it was it was getting a bit close to the bone at that point um, and you know that possibly you know is the most powerful scene for me in the film because I hadn't seen it when they shot it yeah um, and then obviously a lot happens in the edit you know with the with the amp with the music and the feel and the cut yeah. and I, I remember when we we watched it in the screen and I just you know I did need 10 minutes to just go outside and absorb it and I, you know, I just, I think Jamie plays it, you know, wonderfully. And that morning, we uh, held a moment of silence for Marie and for all the, you know, Syrian civilians who've been killed since then. And uh, I'll never forget afterwards, um, two of our, one one stuntman and one extra, um, yeah. these two like big burly guys, um, came up just waterworks, tears down their face, and gave. Paul a huge hug and uh, recognised him from the re media centre. Yeah, these are guys who'd been in Homs at the time when it was all happening, were on set playing Rebels. And yeah, there was a, it was a great, you know, this bear of a man, he just came up, tears flooding down his face, and he goes, I remember you in the media centre. And that that was really, at that point, in the, it was so emotional. And, and one of them, I think, pulled his, he'd, he'd been shot, he pulled his shirt up and he had like, riddled with bullet holes, he'd been shot seven times in the chest and survived <coughs> and there we were on set you know really and but a lot of them little situations weren't there were people you know had been there the day she marie was killed or or been in and out the media center or the field clinic and you know it was quite a powerful thing when you come across someone in that environment who says i remember you we were there and we remember marie yeah yeah so because Paul, you've been talking about all of this a lot, haven't you, for the last six months or so, yeah. maybe more. Yeah. Paul's kind of been on tour doing. Tell me, be sick of me and I'll. No, no, I'll no. Go. No, but but I remember um, we did a we did another one of these at the Curzon, didn't we? We did a big um, Sunday Times screening of Paul's documentary, which is you must go and see. In fact, it's on it's on the BBC, isn't it next? Monday. Next Monday, BBC Four. It's a good kind of yin yang to this. Um, but and I remember you saying to I, me saying to you, do you find it kind of upsetting or is it kind of slightly traumatic reliving this all the time? And you said to me, no, this is she no, wanted because, to tell I mean, the story. Look, no, this is part of what I, you know when in when I got out of Homs after Maria killed that was killed. I was there for another five six days, 
and had to be right you know we did this insane rescue attempt where a lot of people were killed getting us out and it it was in the tunnel they were trying to get me on this motorbike to drive me through this long tunnel and there were women and kids because you there. had a really badly injured leg yeah, just, yeah. yeah quite a big hole um, <laughs> my leg and and they were trying to get me on this bike and I wouldn't get on it because there were women and kids there and in the end it was you know I was being very British yeah. and they're going no look your friends are dead our friends are dead their families are dead you know go out and tell the story and and I, and I actually made a promise I will tell your story so you know every time I come to one of these and every time I talk about it I'm doing what I, I promised I'd do and it's still happening you know this is eight years down the, seven seven years down the line it's still going on so no I'll come and do this till you know when they're all safely tucked up in bed back in Syria then I'll take then I'll knock it on the head but till then yeah no problems here, it? and I think that there's such power in the story I mean of course for all of us at the paper it was you know, awful to to lose a colleague, but the but because Syri the whole Syrian war has gone on for so long, and now with this new judgment against Assad and the kind of retargeting of journalism, it's like this is a story that's going to go on being told. I mean, it, hopefully, it becomes a a kind of metaphor for everything that's going wrong with what's go with, with the kind the, of truth telling you know, business. This, this, you know, this film takes it to a whole audience. Yes, who would that never would never see the documentary or, or read the or book or read or the paper it, or yeah. You know, and that's that's one of the, it really does educate people not only about what a, an incredible loss to journalism, <laughs> but you know what's going on in the world. You know the the city story is still active and running. So the more people, you know, for every one person sees it as another person educated about that. Should we have to take another question? Yes, lady in the front row. Thank you. Thank you for one of the most extraordinary dramatization of real life in the documentary. In fact, I think on a very personal basis, watching it, not only did we reduce to tears, but the idea that you were so close because of your involvement, Paul, and giving counseling that what we were witnessing on the screen wasn't just a Hollywood film. It was a, a documentary that was dramatized in a way that s stayed very close to reality. But a question for you, Paul. Um, in the opening sequences of the uh, film when she first encounters you and she takes you on. I was just curious about what you knew about Marie and how you felt about working for a woman, which, I mean, being a, a photojournalist as well, I mean, our, 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 our percentage of the world is like 3% that goes out anywhere. How you felt working for a woman well, and I didn't the woman she I was. I worked <laughs> with a woman, you know, I didn't work for Marie. We were a team, so I never, I never, <laughs> no, well, it's like, if Marie had said do this, I'd go bollocks, I'm doing this, you know, it wasn't like that, you know, and it always, always happens with, you know, photographers are always put down as, you know, so-and-so's photographer, it really wasn't like that, and I had no qualms working with her, she was absolute dream, we were both as crackers as each other, and it, and it worked, but, no, I mean, I knew of her, everyone knew her, you know, she showed up in the field, and it was like, oh, she's here. Didn't you meet her first in Iraq? No, in Syria. In Syria, yeah. no, uh, when she came into the hotel. Yeah, and that was in the, yeah. D after tell him the story of that. Yeah. It's like, after he built the boat, he's like, she's like, I want to buy a drink for the guy who built the boat. Uh, essentially, I tried to build, I did build a boat, I succeeded, and tried to sail into Iraq across the Tigris because I was bored. <laughs> <laughs> and all the, the background to this is all the hacks were, were put in a hotel and they were told not to go anywhere, not to try and get across the Tigris into Iraq <laughs> under any circumstances. So they were quite cross with you, weren't they? They hated me, no one had <laughs> to me. I was like a... a pariah. Billy no mate. <laughs> I built this boat trying to cross into a raft not a strictly a boat got well, captured was it, wasn't it made out of like tires in, and inner tubes inner and, tubes and, and, and bits and of wood <laughs> anyway I got caught and got eventually got released the Syrian army caught me and that sent me back to the hotel no one had talked to me because I was spoiling their war and then Marie walked in and she goes who and where is the boatman <laughs> <laughs> she just, she just come up and she goes, Boatman, I like your style. Can I buy you a whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was a, it was a, I a love that story. partnership made in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the chap over there, the blue um, jumper. Hi, thanks, thanks for making these movies, especially in these, uh, these times. Got two questions, similar question for both, both guests. Uh, the question of the director, 
what you want to achieve with this movie when you start thinking about making it what you where you want to bring this movie what you, who you want to talk to what message you want to deliver and uh, to Paul is uh, Paul if this movie were made on your story and you were asked the question why you doing this what drives you in your in, in your job what drives you going around the world being uh, uh, being uh, uh, evidence of these stories do you want to go first, Matt? Yeah, why don't you go, Matt? I'll think of an answer. <laughs> um, I think, you know, when I start a film, I never really think about, like, what I'm trying to accomplish, per se. Um, I think if you start down that path early on, you're sort of doing it for the wrong reasons. It's always, for me, often a question, a question that sort of plagues me or challenges me. And, and I think in this case, you know, I, I really want to try to understand what drives somebody like Marie and probably m many people in this room, uh, you know, to go to the most dangerous places on earth, um, and you know, tell these stories, and then the effects that that had on her, you know, mentally and physically over time. Um, I think now that the film is done and you know, edited and out in the world, I don't know. I, I think you know, Marie and and you know, many of you obviously you know probably knew her and, and know this, f you know, far better than I. But you know, she had this amazing ability to. To create empathy, to to make you know human connections, um, to get people to stop and to think and to care um, about people that are often so far away, um, and I hope in some small way that this film does that. That this film allows you um, allows audiences around the world to stop and, and ponder the, the you know more the world that we're living in, and and you know the people that she fought for, which are the poor civilians so often caught in the crossfire of these geopolitical conflicts. You know, she, she fought to give voice to the voices. She fought um, to tell stories that people weren't telling. And I hope, again, that this film does that in, in a way. And I think, you know, ob obviously the third act of the film, the, or the third quarter of the film, um, in Syria, you know, the spotlight sort of shifts a bit away from, from Rosamond and from, from Marie into the story that she was telling. And that, you know, that was not, uh, an accident. Paul, why do you why do you do it? Oh, look, it's the same. It's the same. I mean, just look at what, every picture on this wall. You know, you look at them and you feel something, don't you? You know that that soldier's eyes, his face. Don McCullen. Yeah. Go go uh, and but, see I his mean, exhibition there, at the Tate. Everyone. There isn't brilliant. a picture here that doesn't doesn't do that. No. And you know that's it's a really you know war is such a big, messy, nasty thing, and to make it real, you know. I mean, I do that with pictures. Marie did it with words, and you know, it's it's a, the people who always you know suffer in any of these conflicts. If you go to the root of where it's all happening, it's you know for us it was the women and the kids in the basements, and you know all of the getting in and the bang bang and the the, the lunacy involved in getting to that spot. When you get there, and we walk down into the steps in the widow's basement, which is an incredibly powerful scene. That's what we were doing. You yeah. know, and it, it, that's that's <coughs> the point. And it's it was with Marie and with everyone who does that. It's you actually believe you can make a difference. You know, if you don't, if you think you're just there to tell a story, that's pointless. You have to believe. And Marie firmly believed. That's why we stayed. Yeah. Uh, if we stayed and we got this story out and presented it to the world, in that we could actually, you know, perhaps stop this bombardment that was going on. That is the motivation. If you think you can do that. And, and you stand and a chance of it, then that that's why you're there to and make that and difference. And Marie had form on that, hadn't she? She'd she already did. done it in East Timor. Yeah, um, she, she incredible did it in previous. Chechenia. I mean, she was. It's so amazingly brave in terms of what she would do. Or what, there's the great line. Uh, the other thing that's brilliant, if you're interested in this whole story, is Lindsay Hilson's um, book, her biography of Marie, which has got, if you like these kind of stories, there's some fantastic tales in there but but she has the great line in East Timor doesn't she they, they don't they don't like men they don't the editor goes well, where are all the you know men where are all the soldiers she's well I guess they don't like men they don't make men like they used to you know <laughs> she always reckoned she was much tougher than kind of and more brave often and more courageous than many of the men or soldiers or reporters out there um there was a question there yes lady in the pink jumper um, the other issue that the film highlights really well is the mental health issue. Um, and there's that brilliant scene where Marie is describing 
that contradiction in herself between wanting to be at the front line of the war and yet being terrified at, at the same time. And I just wondered whether things have improved <coughs> in terms of supporting reporters' mental health now, or is it just assumed that they are kind of part of the, the military in that PTSD is a factor that may happen, and um, <coughs> or are there mechanisms, should we be doing more to support reporters? Um, I think that there has been a real sea change on this, I think partly since Marie died, and actually, since too much, in this weekend's um, Sunday Times magazine, there's a piece by Louise Callahan who won the Marie Colvin Award um, for, um, from reporting last year, and she's talking about how now, rather than just going to the bar and kind of getting drunk, there's a lot more there's a lot more talk about the effect that it has on you seeing these things. I think there's a much broader understanding about trauma um, in society. And I think certainly as ex an executive on a newspaper, you have a much greater sense of your kind of duty of care to the people that you're sending into these situations. I think as a society, we've all become much more literate in the kind of the, the language of a kind of mental health. And I think that that's really, really true now of, of kind of reporters. But I think partly because of stories like Marie's, of course you can't look at all that stuff and it not have an effect on you. What, what do you think, Paul? I'm fine. <laughs> not, not, <laughs> nothing wrong with me. No, I mean, inevitably, it has. He just has another beer. It has. <laughs> Did he hold these sessions in bars? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, uh, look, you know, it wasn't like we spent all our time out in the field, kind of. It can't be like that in the field. You know, you, you're strong for each other. Marie had a real terror, and rightly so, of what happened out in the field. There was, the, she wasn't, you know, she really wasn't gung-ho. I'd been into city a couple of weeks before, for a few days, and I came out and she said, you know, how is it? And I, I, you know, I told her straight, it was terrifying, we had to go, you know, the journey in was enough to to make you seriously think twice, but, and, and I, I was quite honest with her and I said, it is an absolute nightmare, you know, it's midnight, it's running across fields, through tunnels, it's, it's horrendous, and, you know, it wasn't like Libya, where you had a safe haven where the you know the, the rebels held. When you got when you crossed that border into Lebanon, into into Syria, you were in. You know there were Assad checkpoints and army camps and snipers fifty yards away as we ran there's through. There's no easy way out. No, and it was, you know it was hard getting in, and you weren't getting out that easily. But Marie was aware. But you know there was a real. Gen we sat in Beirut watching on a laptop the cameras that these guys had up on the media center. And it was quite bizarre. It's not often you get to sit there and watch the place you're going into getting blown to hell. And every day we'd sit there and go, that's where we're going. And, you know, and you don't get that. And, that, and we had a deal. If anyone said no, they said no. And the other one, there was no pressure. But she was terrified. And, you know, but she kept it together. I kept it together. And we went. Um, so all of the... But when you're sitting there, knowing that you're going into somewhere where the kind of bombs are raining down on it, how do you feel about that? Isn't there kind of every bit of your self-preservation is saying, yeah, yeah, I'm, don't, you know, and, don't go? And I've t I talked about it, you know, after Libya, you know, you kind of, you're sitting there and, and you, you know, genuinely you're hoping something happens where you don't have to go, where they come and say you can't go. I would, at that point, when you're watching that, you go, Ooh, oh, well, we tried. Yeah. But they didn't, they come in and go, you can go, and you go, oh, great. Uh, great. <laughs> And but we knew, you know, we didn't go in. But yet, uh, what, what I'm trying to say is, like, it's not, you know, the portrayal of Marie and the PTSD and that. I didn't see that because we were in the field, you know, and that couldn't happen. You know, yeah. I could spot when Marie was was really nervous, and and I'd crack a joke and try and bring it out of it, and she could spot it in me because it worked both ways, and that that was the team how a team works and with Marie it was wonderful because we, we didn't have to tell each other things we just did we knew what we needed to do but yeah when you come out it's you all of a sudden you come from that and you know we did two months in Libya in Misrata under the siege and that was in you know quite an intense phase um, and when you go home that's when the problems start because you come out of that yeah, and the all of a sudden you're on a plane and you're back home and people are going me phone bill and all of that and you're sitting there going yeah, can't handle and it, it's really difficult and so you get into this cycle where you'll get the next call to go somewhere and you go, oh, it's a relief, I don't have to deal with that. Because yeah. I'm actually out there, It's easier to it? deal with a war than, than BT. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, all her expenses. Oh, I think they so, were anyway. always a, oh. they were always yeah. a, big, a big thing. There's a, the gentleman at the back with his with his hand up. Sorry, we're coming to you. What? I was going to say, Matthew. <coughs> Matthew, first of all, congratulations. It was a staggering how you captured Maria. I almost felt like I was in the room with her, about to knock back a few vodkas. Um, <laughs> it, was, it really was exceptional, the way you captured her character and her spirit. Um, but Paul, I wanted to ask you, really, you a question, really. Um, besides Cheers, mate. I was dancing with them. Like <laughs> <laughs> well, they always say that you deal with PTSD with excessive drinking and bad <laughs> disco dancing. And Paul's an example of that. Um, but Paul, I wanted to ask you really about the, the particularly the critical times in Syria. We, the, the, at the core of this film is this idea of making a difference and how far should you go, what risks should you take? And I'd really like to understand from you what those discussions were with, with Maria at that time, in those particular discussions. And ultimately, in a way, perhaps she was, I mean, obviously she ended up being killed, but in a way she was right, because if you are going to be a war correspondent, you have to put your body and mind on the line in a way, if you're going to tell those stories. So I'd be interested to know what she said about that in those particular critical moments. Um, God, again, it was, it, they weren't real moments. There, were, there was one moment going back in, it's, it's in the film in a, a kind of shortened version where we were getting it back into the tunnel. We'd been in Baba Amra for a few days and then it was like, you're getting out again, that they're going to attack and we didn't want to go, they made us go. We got out and the attack didn't come and we woke up the next morning and it was like, shit, we made a mistake. And it, at that point, you know, everyone was quite relieved that we got out of Baba Amra. We got the stuff, we'd done the widow's basement, we were out. Um, and then Marie came up to me and I, I would, I'd crashed out on the couch or something and she was like, Paul, they didn't attack. We fucked up. And it was like, oh, we did. And so we were both in, you know, it was like, oh, and uh, we spoke to the foreign desk and they said, you know, oh, go and report from Hammer or, and you know, Marie was just like, after this, sh the shock of it, it, the attack didn't come and sunk in, it was like, we have to go back. It was like, yep. So it was discussed on that level. We knew, we knew it was dangerous, obviously, because we'd just come from there. Didn't you have a bad feeling about it? Well, this is what, you know, and on the way, I, I agreed to go back, no problem, I knew we had to. We, we, we didn't get what we wanted. And there was more, and you know, there was an attack coming. And, you know, I always say, you know, Marie used to say, well, why am I going to run if they can't run? And that summed Marie up. But on the way back in, I did at one point, I had this, like, awfully sickly feeling of something. Was, and I just said, look, Marie, while our translator, I said, I've got a really bad feeling about this. I don't know what it is. It's nothing I've seen. It's nothing I know that you don't know. It's just a gut instinct. And Marie listened politely for a minute and went, well, I'm the journalist and you're the photographer. I'm going in. If you want to go home, you can. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, show up at the desk. Where's Maria? Oh, she, she went in. <laughs> you know what she's like. So, it, I, you know, obviously, I, we had, that was the discussion. That's about as deep as it got. But, you know, there was, it was just, I wasn't even trying to talk it out of it. I was just had to say, I've got okay. this feeling. Um, you know, and actually, the, we turned the phones off and all the satellite gear, and we didn't tell the paper we were going back in. We, ju we just kind of went. We phoned them off when we were back in. It was like, hi, we're back. Um, but, you know, Marie believed in it that much, and I did. You know, I wouldn't have gone back in if I didn't believe what we were doing. We knew there was an oncoming slaughter, and we firmly believed if we could get another one of those, you know, and in the end, that was the baby. You know, that yeah. baby we was our last grasp attempt at getting something out because we'd had a discussion the day before Marie died, I said, look, Marie, we're not going to be alive by Friday to file. You know, it's over. There were people dying left, right and centre. They were coming in. Most of the people who took us in were dead. A lot of the hospital staff were dead. And it was just a matter of time. And so that's why we decided to do the Channel 4, CNN, the BBC piece. It was, we've come this far. We're okay. not going to file. That's not going to happen. Let's broadcast, you know. And, it, and I think that shows, you know, just the determination of Marita believed that she could affect the outcome. She thought if we just pushed it to the limit and six hours later she was dead, you know, that's, and it did, you know, it affected the outcome in a, in a sense, but you know, not, not perhaps as, as fully as we'd have liked to. Lots of hands. Um, the lady here in the grey scarf, you've had your hand up for a while. <laughs> 
Um, I was kind of intrigued by the scene between Sean and Marie by the river. And it's a question really to, to you, Eleanor, and being part of the backstory and knowing the players, and, and you, Matthew, if I interpreted it correctly, she was wavering then, and sh he was pushing her to go on. And I'm just wondering, in, in terms of duty of care and you know the whole issue of uh, how does that, did I interpret it correctly, and, and what, what was the significance of that scene and what was going on there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, it's so easy in film in general to sort of create oversimplified portraits of, of people. And I think I, with all my characters and with that relationship <laughs> especially, I want to really embrace the complexity. Um, you know, it's not just... Um, not black and white you know he's you know they they need each other he needs the scoop you know she needs him to send her there um you know on some level you know they were dear friends as well and they, and they cared about each other uh on another level you know they used each other so exploring that was was quite interesting to me and i think um you know important to explore that dynamic between you know the editor and and uh, and Marie. Um, I was an executive on the paper during that time. I was the editor of the news review section um, for a long time. I had an office next to Sean Ryan because I was the focus editor on the Sunday Times. I um, mean, as Paul says, she went back into Holmes without the permission of the of the foreign editor. They didn't. We you know to the paper <laughs> didn't want her to go back. He skyped when we were there. Yeah, and going, going what? And Marie's going, don't answer it. Tell him I'm not in. Yeah, tell him I'm not in. That's exactly. I mean, Just have the shops. The the idea, yeah, exactly. The idea that any editor really control Marie is a bit of a fallacy, as a, you know her friends would know. Um, she was the the point about the kinds of people who do these jobs is they're not people who take orders particularly well you know they're the kind of people who when they get to a door and the door's closed that's the beginning you know somebody saying no there's no way you can go there is where they go right you know how do we start going around the sides or you know that's not to say there's not a duty of care from the paper and I think I think that there there really was I mean I can certainly tell you I mean I've just sent Christina Lamb another brilliant Sunday Times foreign correspondent to Nigeria um, last week she was in a really dangerous pe place and the kind of security protocols that you know have now have to go to to send anyone anywhere I mean the kind of the, the, the risk assessments the security that has to be in the field to kind of pull them out the um, the way that they have to check in like for several times a day and if they're 10 minutes late there's all sorts of um, programs which gets kind of activated to get people out and I think <laughs> all of that has become much more yeah. that's probably now that's that's you know slightly shutting you know shutting the stable door after after the, the horse has bolted but we're still sending people to dangerous places but i think that the idea that sean was trying to persuade marie to do things that she didn't want to do is you know, anyone who knows marie knows that that's not true um and i think also marie herself as you've seen in this film was was kind of quite ambivalent about it you know she knew she knew she was getting older i mean lindsay hilson writes about this in her book you know she she was getting older she she was brilliant at what she did. She was a fantastic war correspondent. And it's very hard if you have a, a kind of metier and that's what most makes you feel alive and that's when you're kind of most yourself and most kind of doing what you're brilliant at to decide you're not going to do that anymore. And I think she was I think she was also kind of worried about what she was if she wasn't doing that or could she feel like herself or, you know, when you talk about when she comes back, that's when things feel more difficult. So I think then the urges to kind of go back into what feels familiar, which is being somewhere very risky and telling those stories. That's what you're really living to do. I mean, she had a real passion for that. She was brilliant at it. So I think it's really, it's really, really complicated. And of course, you know, all of us at the Sunday Times, we, 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 we were really, we were really fond of her. The, her foreign editor, you know, kind of really loved her. John Witherow, the editor of the Sunday Times, loved Marie. They were great friends. No one was trying to put her in a situation where she wasn't going to come back. It was, it was terrible for everyone. And, you know, also for her. Really good one. When I come back, I got out of Aussie. They call me up on the 13th floor. <laughs> and they go, Paul, it's about your risk assessment. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and they pulled it up like that. And they went, it's like massive big form. And I'd only filled in one bit. 
It was like, what is the greatest danger you expect to come across in Syria? And I'd just written trench foot. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, should we shred this? And it was like, it's for the best. <laughs> Marie went mad when she saw, caught me filling it in, even though I was just writing <laughs> trench foot. She goes, what are you doing? What yeah. is that? I was like, I don't know, they just sent me a... Yeah. But she thought it was cheating. She said, you're cheating. You're cheating, filling in the, said, the risk assessment. I don't even know assessment. what it is. So it's, so it's quite hard if you're sending somebody where you even fill in a risk assessment form somewhere really dangerous. There's always a kind of... You know, it's, not, it's not the easiest, slightly like herding cats. <laughs> That's another question. Um, yes. Hi, I'm not a journalist, so I'm totally in awe uh, with regard to what journalists go through to report from really dangerous zones, and I think the film is doing an amazing job kind of showing the public how, you know, what kind of uh, sacrifices people take to do it. I mean, I'm getting scared when I have to go to Hackney. <laughs> so, um, Understandable. <laughs> but I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've got a serious question behind that, given how much people risk to do these amazing jobs, reporting from these zoons, telling the stories, and obviously also creating political awareness and hoping for political change. How frustrating is it to see our Western governments not really maybe reacting the way you would expect to? Because, I mean, the Syria thing, and I'm not an expert on, on, on the Syria war, but it's been going on for such a long time, and there doesn't seem to be much of an improvement and we're all you know in this kind of brexit madness so i'm wondering how frustrating is it for journalists to put so much on the line to tell a story and to get people to react to see that the west sometimes really sleeps and it's so self-absorbed does it does it make a difference i, mean, I think there's two parts of that question i think one is it's it's not only do they not um are they not paying attention? But it, you know, at least in my country, um, you know, journalists are being vilified, and um, you know, the whole profession is, is is being sort of questioned by our by our leader, which is is, is so depressing. Um, you know, we should be celebrating, not denigrating, uh, journalists and uh, the sacrifices that they make. Um, and I think. You know, anyone who's worked in Syria or touched Syria or reported on Syria or knows someone from Syria or is from Syria, um, I think is, is sort of honestly devastated the fact that the, the amount of inaction, you know, the fact that this tragedy has persisted. Uh, I think if Marie were alive today, um, she'd be, you know, walking up and down the streets trying to get anyone to listen uh, about what's happening. You know, maybe she'd be in Yemen, maybe she'd be somewhere else, but um, I think it's that's one of the, the tragedies to me at the end of the film, is that as we pull out and we see that devastation, yes, she's just one piece of that, but that, that one piece, you know, has continued and continued and continued for years um, with, with no real end in sight. Um, so I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a sad situation. But I think the fact that Eight years on, we're all still here talking about it. The fact that it was front page news again on Friday because of the judgment in America, that you know we're not we're not letting this one go. You know she didn't she didn't die in vain. And if the pressure is kept up on Assad and his regime, if the money is confiscated, um, which the Assad's assets are frozen all over the world, and some of that money can be um, channeled, they say that the, um, Marie's family are owed three hundred million pounds in compensation, which would all go to her humanitarian kind of causes. They've set up a charity for. Um, in her name, then you know that that would definitely be something good that came out of it. And I think the fact that so many journalists are now being targeted, that, that Marie's story has become a, a real kind of metaphor for what's going on with the press. Trump talking about fake news, journalists being killed for telling the truth. We're in the, we're in a kind of really intense propaganda war. If you think about kind of Russian bots and people trying to kind of get your attention and tell you that things aren't true or so confusion. I think there's never been a more important moment to really explain the importance of journalism, people risking their lives to tell the truth. And if you know Marie, if Marie died to get that message out there, I think she she think yeah, that mean, that it, was a good message. It's it's, like, it's you know if if it was a case of you went out to do a job and you came back and nothing changed, you know that is not a reason to go out. You know if you don't see an immediate result, it can be disheartening. Of course it is. You know I've had to sit and watch 
city have fallen to pieces, you know, piece by piece over the years. But you never know when you do that job. You never know what's going to happen ten years down the line, as is stuff beginning to happen now. Yeah. Um, you know, if people didn't go back because they didn't get the result they want, the world would be a pretty dark place. You know, it would just give these tyrants and and, and murderers the ideal conditions to work in. You know, dark. They do not like the light being shined on them. So you've got to have a bit of faith in the knowledge that whatever you do, at some point there's a, a, a real possibility it will make, it will affect change, albeit down the line. Second part is I think our governments at the West have behaved abysmally towards Syria. They have abdicated any sense of moral responsibility and, as I've said countless times, doing nothing isn't policy. It's just doing nothing. And they've sat and watched while Russia moved in, the Iranians have moved in, Hezbollah moved in, and the people, now that the Syrian pe the revolution and the people are being crushed, the people sitting at that table deciding Syria's future are Russia, Iran, Assad, yeah. Hezbollah. You know, we, shameful behavior. You know, it's not as if people didn't know what was happening there. And it's been a series of look the other way and hope someone sorts it out. And, you know, that has been, an absolute disaster for the Syrians. Eight years of this, and they're still there. And <coughs> we're all sitting now going, oh, all these, you know, I, I said when there were 7,000 people dead, if you want to stop this, get to Putin, get safe havens in the north and the south. That stuff can be done early to prevent it spiraling into, you know, the, the biggest catastrophe of this, the, this century, you know. We do live in a democracy, I and mean, the more that people know about this stuff, the fact that Marie went there and died to, got the, to get the story out, the fact that you will come and watch the film and, you know, hopefully you'll tell other people about it and it becomes part of the conversation. We can't take for granted the fact of a, fr of a free press or that there are people like that who will go and do things. Or There's also the, the, the whole aspect of how you pay for this kind of journalism because sending, you know, Paul and Marie into Homs is incredibly expensive. And in a world where the kind of money for paying for journalism because all the advertising is going to go Google and Facebook is becoming increasingly hard to sustain. It's the massive cuts for BuzzFeed and Vice and all sorts of online media sites Huffington Post who are trying to kind of pick up some of the mantle digitally from what newspapers have done. To, to, to fund this kind of journalism costs money and at the moment also the whole newspaper sphere is in a slight state of kind of funding crisis but it matters if you're going to hold tyrants to account or you know, if, de if democracy... It's going to it's going to flourish. So, you know, we all have a responsibility to think about how we go on funding people to go and write those kind of stories as well. My, my mother wrote for the Sunday, excuse me, for the Washington Post, and their their motto is "Democracy dies in darkness." Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's have another, uh, one more question. How much? Um, oh, I was just going to ask you as well as potentially affecting political change, which of course would be amazing. Do you think that this film? I mean, Marie was obviously about telling the people's story. Do you think that the film would be a success if perhaps it changed the, some of the bigoted views on the streets of our country that they, people might have towards Syrian refugees and take a different stance, just look twice and just see the sort of person behind their first, you know, first impression? That would make your film a success. Forget Hollywood, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to. Um, I would love to hope that that could happen. I would love to hope that people um, will have a greater understanding of, of why people are fleeing Syria, uh, why we are in this refugee crisis. Um, <coughs> whether that happens, you know, it's not up to me. Um, but I, but I hope, you know, and that's you know that's why I, I have a deep belief that you know our world is so divided. Um, and that film has an ability to, to bring people together, to provoke conversation, to create dialogue, and, and I hope that this film does that. Paul, let's give you a last word, and then we're going to wrap up, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, look, we, we've seen the Syrian crisis. Remember the, when the, 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 ba the picture of the baby on the beach in Turkey? And there was this whole, you know, outpour, and people were opening their homes, you know, people working out how to get refugees in, and you know, and it, little thing like that. I think there was an attack in Germany, and all of a sudden, it was like, damn, it's the refugees, and that that, that changed in overnight, and that's how fickle it is. You know, when you know people have got this 
I've spoken to so many Syrian refugees. I did an exhibition with the Red Cross about Syrian refugees made it leave to remain in Britain, and, ev and Matt, I'm sure, will testify to this. The hardest decision anybody ever makes when there's a war is not to flee the house, not to flee the village, not to flee the city, it's to step over that border into another country and say goodbye to everything. And when you got some dickhead sitting there writing, they're coming here for 50 quid a week in a free house, you know, how do you, how do you put them together? You know, it's, uh, but, you know, that people are like, you know, people read it and there is an element of our society that believe shite. And <laughs> It, that's, and that is shit. <laughs> Too shite, someone said. But it is, you know, and it, the, but that's all it takes. It went from the kid on the beach, an outpouring of genuine sympathy, open the doors, one bad headline, and it's all like, keep the refugees out. It's in, insanity. I hope the film fixes that. Good. Matthew? No, I was just going to say thank you all for, for coming tonight. And, and uh, the film is, is opening uh, on the 15th. Um, 15th, I was just going to say that, 15th so, of February, so please, cinemas. Uh, if, you, if you like the film, even if you hated the film, um, just tell your friends. Um, and yeah, thank you all for, for coming. <laughs> thank you so much.